Hello and welcome to another out and about video and today or this morning we are covering the story that personally I think has been long forgotten um, and whether or not it's because the people of a certain village don't want this story retelling anymore it's hard to say uh, but uh, information on what we're about to talk about is very sparse Well, basically we're here or close to a village known as Ewood Bridge And it's not far from Edenfield which is in that direction and Haslingdon which is in that direction So it's kind of in the middle But uh, a brutal murder took place back in October 1950 um, and the body of a young man was found in a plate layer's cabin and for those who may not be aware but a plate layer's cabin is basically a small wooden hut which the workers or employees who work for railway lines used to use um, you know they used to spend time obviously throughout the day or night evening whatever um, and they'd go out and about repairing the old lines or removing debris from the lines but uh, they were known as plate layers cabins they probably still are today but this is where the story took place back in 1950 uh, and as we make our way to which we think is the location we'll tell you more about the events that uh, unfolded on October the 9th 1950 so this lane that we've made our way down from from the very top up there um, this is the lane that was used by two young Yugoslavian men back in 1950 a young man by the name of Rodimir Jorovic and a companion called Nenad Kovacevic now for the sake of this video we're going to call them by the first names because I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the surnames correctly Kovacevic and Jorovic so we'll just call them by the first names Radomir and Nenad but both were Yugoslav refugees and both living over in Blackburn at the time of the events that took place in 1950 but the story was both of them had traveled over to Edenfield presumably from Blackburn to meet with some other Yugoslavian um, refugees and especially some women two young women and I think one of the women had a girl by the, the name of I think it was Liza or Lisa Seabert or Cybert, I'll put the name down below she was a close friend of Nenad's um, and it was here in like, like I said 1950 where both men had made the way down but the weather was terrible they departed from a bus at the bus stop where then three houses are just in front there used to be a pub called the Horse and Jockey and the bus stop was directly outside now they are obviously private residences and the bus stops further to the, the left of the houses uh, we'll show you that uh, on the way back out but the both men made the way down here it was raining and apparently from the path line or the roadway at the top you've got to go across two fields now this is the first major field we do have the motorway or the bypass just in front of the A56 and across that we do have the second field so I do apologise for the background noise but both men as they departed the bus in the distance they noticed further down a cabin 
So they thought they'd make their way down there because, um, well, they were on this way anyway, I should say, because they were going, to, uh, uh, well, towards a bridge that was just off the East Lancs Railway. But they did notice a plate-laced cabin, so they made their way to, towards that just simply to get out of the rain. I think it's safe to say that this flyover, this bridge, back in 1950, obviously wasn't here. And the path that we just walked down used to cut straight across this way. Uh, but we're going to go over the bridge, I'm going to make our way to, like I said, this scene of where all this took place, what, over 72 years ago? But this is uh, the A56, and like I said, Haslingdon is just in that direction. And if you keep on going in this direction, that takes you towards Bury, the town of Bury. But as you can see, this can get a quite a busy, uh, busy motorway or bypass. Now as you can see, the pathway itself has gone a hell of a lot narrower um, but it's still clearly a public footpath. So, as I said, on this channel we never trespass and if we're not sure, we'll knock on people's doors. So yeah, we'll keep on going, Let's see where this takes us, but this should be now close to where the East Lanks railway I should say passed through and in fact I could just see it then through the actual bushes let's get, get around here yeah you won't be able to see it through the camera but just there I can see the lines but that is the East Lanks railway so we'll make our way down so now this is pretty much where the events of 1950 quickly uh, turned pear shaped on a on a serious scale. Nearly slip then. Just going to go down this way. I'll show you guys the, the actual rail railway. Right, and here we are. This is it. Out of breath. Just, can you guys see over the wall? So this is the railway where both men had made their way down to and we'll try and find the actual where the plate lace cabin was and we'll take you guys with us. So how do we know that this is the actual location where both men uh, came to? Well in a couple of the newspaper articles that we've uncovered, a couple of the witnesses um, who worked in this area all said to get to the actual cabin you had to cross two fields which we mentioned about earlier so this is the second field just here they had to climb over a high wall to get to the actual bridge and cabin itself which is in this direction now what makes this bit more prominent the description of the actual route to the actual plate layers cabin also said that once they've passed over two fields which is in that direction there was also a high wall and several fences they had to uh, get themselves over. Now, this wall here, I don't think is the high wall that they're talking about, simply because that takes you directly onto the rail track. So, you might be wondering why, if both men, like I said, they weren't, I won't say close companions, but they were friends to a point. So you'd be asking, well, why would, it turned to obviously the story again to which was murder and like I said 
as we're walking down that private lane um, it seems that both men were winding each other up over the events of the war which we've talked about but it got to the point where Nenad when they got to the plate layer's cabin he put Radomir in like a headlock and he ruffled his hair and obviously this wound Radomir up to the point where both men started throwing punches now it was during the fight and it's hard to explain why we, we can't answer it because Nenad during the police investigations and being questioned it was always apologetic, apologetic is that the word? Um, for what he'd done, he, he, he instantly when he was arrested and we'll get to that a bit shortly but when he was arrested he instantly admitted to murdering Radomir he never deviated away from it, he never tried to get out of it he tried to get away, tried to escape so he wouldn't be caught but once caught he never denied obviously killing him but why and how? Well, when they got to the plate layer's cabin, and like I said, everything kicked off to the extent it did, uh, Nenad, he remember telling the police that he'd seen an axe lying on the floor close to the door as you go into the actual building, into the hut. So we can only assume that because the fight was escalating, both men full of anger, Nenad's just picked the axe up and he's used it to attack Radomir. I mean, obviously enough to the point where Radomir would die from the injuries, from the wounds to the back of his head. Now we're here at the point where, where I personally think the actual plate layers cabin was and hopefully you'll see why shortly now the route we've taken you which seemed quite a walk we've come from that direction and round the hill and up we could be way off the mark but we can only go off the press reports at the time and you know how to get to the plate layers cabin and you only have to look around and you can see the fields you know this this could be one field and like I said by the bypass over the opposite other side of the bypass that is the second field it is quite conceivable both men came this way made the way straight down directly from the main road it is conceivable um, unluck unluckily for us there isn't enough like I said out there to to, to pinpoint it exactly but I can only assume what they've done they've walked down the path at the side of where the horse and jockey public house was and they followed the way around and they've ended up coming to this point here because to get across the fields i mean i know the press report said there were high walls and fields and fences going now obviously you've got old fences here you've got probably fences further back but it was raining so to walk down a muddy embankment and fields such as this it might be an extreme ask but where we are here now there is old remnants of what i think would have been the bridge and i think it's this bridge that they were crossing to get to the opposite side when they saw or they found the plate lace cabin so we'll make our way to it now and uh, hopefully we might be able to find some evidence of where that hut was so as you can see where Vicky's standing there is a high wall there's a pathway there's another high wall which leads to the rail track I think this is exactly the walls that they were talking about um, the witnesses and the people who worked here because all these are original features these would have been here in the early 1900s when the railway line was built and like Vicky's just points out you've still got the old I think the drain pipes I mean look at these these are literally their original features now as we make our way down into the bottom of this this is what I mean about the high wall I keep talking about high walls but we're going off people's descriptions now look where Vicky is now and look how high the wall is behind her and in front of her and we only have to pan around I safely said these are definitely high walls now we'll make our way around now this I think is the bridge I mean obviously there's some kind of, you could class it as a bridge this is the where the railway lines obviously going I mean look at that well over 100 years old and we're underneath the East Lancs Railway. I mean, look at this. I 
It's always a matter of car way under. Vicky's panting now. That's the walk, took it out of us. Now you only have to st uh, stand back. Now that, our class as the, the, the bridge. This is where they made the way through. Now we can only assume that they've perhaps made the way up here. And if I can show you, I'll try and pinpoint the actual where I think the plate layers cabin was. As we come up to this point here. Now the plate lace cabin, I think, you can't really see it, but I think it's just beyond this wall here, on this side of the track bed, where these trees are. It was either there, or it was on this side here, where these trees are. Just trying to see if we can get a better shot. So the plate lace cabin was literally feet away from the track bed of the East Lanks Railway. I've got a feeling it was on that side just where this tree is here and it was just literally in front of those trees because it said it was near an eye embankment which is that side so we think this is where the two men made the way to after walking from that direction they've come down and obviously under the bridge and they've stopped there and that is where the fight broke out So we could be off the beaten track like I said, but this to me is the bridge that they'd obviously walk through uh, to get to the opposite side. But we think the actual plate lace cabin is on this side of the rail bed, just past this wall here. I'm not sure if we can get to it from here, um, but we'll walk up and we'll see if we can uh, find it. Yeah, so we definitely won't be able to uh, to get to it from this side because obviously, like I said, it's, it's private land. But just where these tree, trees here, it was definitely either this tree line or it was that tree line just past the bridge. Um, it was on one of these sides. But this is where we believe the uh, plate lace cabin was situated. And that is where Radomir's body was obviously ultimately found by Alvar Howarth. Um, and it was October 9th, I think it was a Monday, uh, in 1950. So the police soon arrived at the scene after being alerted and there was a man called Detective Superintendent Lindsay. Now he was the man who was going to take sole charge of this case. And he came down to the actual cabin, the hut, along with several doctors and other police. And they soon quarant quarantined all off so they could start the initial investigations. Now nobody knew who the victim was at the time because like I said Nenad had taken a lot of Radomir's possessions with him so he had no identification. It didn't take long for him to find out however and they soon obviously announced it to the press that the, the body that they found was that indeed of Radomir Jorovic. But they also quickly assert, ascertained or attained that it, um, it wasn't all it seems and that he was seen with another guy called Nenad Kovacevic, who we've obviously spoken about. So bulletins soon went out and they tried to find out where Nenad lived or where he worked. Again, they quickly found out that Nenad was living in lodgings at Caton Street in Blackburn. So they made their way over, but when they got there, they realized or they found out that he had fled. Nobody knew where, but again, I keep using the word soon. This is how quick that the, um, the investigation escalated though. Everything just seemed to occur very quickly. But this soon found out that he'd gone over to Blackpool. But this is where the, the, the trail kind of went cold for a few hours. So they sent out descriptions of Nenad to all the press, to all the police stations, radio stations. And again, the police soon quickly received intel from Staffordshire of all places, Newcastle under Lyme, 
that um, Nenad had been looking at coaches and prices for coaches to take him to London and that he was in Cannock, like I said in Staffordshire. Now two police officers, I think it was Lewis and Shaw, who they'd obviously read the description of Nenad, they'd got intel that he was eating in some uh, form of cafe, but he boarded a coach to London from that point. So they've made their way down and they've, um, they've intercepted the coach. Both police officers have gone on and this is when Nenad was obviously charged, he was arrested and charged and taken in for interviewing over the death of Radimir Jorovic. He is six foot three inch in height with broad shoulders, brown hair, possibly a pencil type moustache and a large, the large nose. He is believed to be wearing a brown suit, cream shirt and collar, brown tie, brown shoes and hat and speaks poor English. Now as we make our way back to the car and where this story obviously began, um, I've, I've pretty much toyed with the idea of making this video because I kind of get the feeling, and I don't know why, because I've not heard anything or read anything online, but I kind of get the, the feeling that perhaps people in this area, Ewood Bridge and what have you, don't want this story retelling. They don't want what happened back in 1950 brought up again. I don't know why, I, don't, I, just, I just had this, this gut feeling and like I said, I was toying with the idea of actually coming out and doing this out and about location video. Um, but I thought, well, this is the whole point of what we do. You know, we, 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 we go out and retell the stories because these things did happen. And I've said it in many videos, you know, just because something horrific happened in the past and horrific things are always going to happen in the future. Surely we can't dismiss it and we can't ignore it. We can't ignore the victims, especially. Um, so we've bit the bullet, we've come out and we've taken you guys with us. Um, like I said, we're retelling the story of poor Radomir and to some extent, poor Nenad. Um, and like I said, we'll see what happens with the comment section, I guess, on YouTube and and if people haven't taken too kindly to uh, to this one in particular video, we'll just see what happens, I guess. So as for uh, Nenad, it was taken to Cannock Police Station, where it was interviewed, obviously, by the Staffordshire Police whilst the Lancashire police made the way down. And Superintendent Lindsay, he was eager to get to, to Staffordshire. So obviously he did his investigation, or his inter interrogation if you will. And like I said, Nenad never once denied being involved in murdering Radomir. You know, he was quite sorrowful about it. Not that it's going to do any good to Radomir, but at least he owned up to it straight away. So it was a very open and shut case was this one. The two things I think Nenad, well three things if you include obviously the murder, but two other things that I think he did wrong personally was obviously taking some of the possessions off Radomir after he killed him, as well as obviously trying to flee from the area, you know, make his way down to London. Because I think it was October the 10th or 11th, he was taken to the Bury Magistrates, obviously in Bury, in that direction, where he would be formally charged with the murder of Radomir. And all these things that I've just spoken about, trying to escape, taking his belongings, his possessions, Radomir's possessions, these will be used against him when his official trial at the Manchester Assizes took place in December that year. During his trial some eight weeks later, Kovacevic would tell the jury that he'd been a member of the army of General Mihailovic, which had been fighting the Germans, whereas Jorovic was a quisling or a traitor in Belgrade during the war and someone who had sided with the Germans. He would go on to tell of how his army had to take refuge in the mountains, 
but his father, two brothers and three sisters had all been shot. This then led to the events leading up to the death of Jorovic on the 9th of October. The post-mortem would reveal that Jorovic had sustained severe trauma that had included nine wounds to his head, along with bruising around both eyes. His skull had been fractured, which had resulted in his death. The prosecutors would use what we spoke about um, against Nenad, basically saying it was all premeditated, he knew what he was doing as he walked down this lane, this private lane. I personally can't, I can't wrap my head around why he would want to kill a comrade, if you will. Regardless of the fact they were egging each other on over the war. Um, I get that Radomir himself, obviously, he wouldn't have taken it well being goaded about his family's murders if you will during the war i get that but i honestly don't believe nenad himself went to that cabin further back solely to uh to kill radomir i just I, I just don't get i don't buy into that at all um but obviously the jury saw differently and nenad he would be given the ultimate verdict and i think the jury disappeared for about an hour and a half, an hour and 20 minutes to come to the verdict. But obviously when they came back into session, um, they obviously gave him the verdict of um, death by murder. He was guilty. Now, the judge obviously at that point didn't have any choice. He had to give Nenad the ultimate punishment and that was death by hanging. Um, now obviously, yeah, I, I can't say too much about the political system or the policing system back in the day. We've, we've covered a lot of stories where criminals were hung, um, rightly or wrongly. But in this case, I honestly do not believe Nenad purposefully went to kill Radomir. And I think his solicitors, his barristers, they all try to get the charge against him lessened to manslaughter, which would obviously have just meant probably life in prison. Now a petition was set up and it gathered over 20,000 signatures. 20,000 signatures. Not for a reprieve, but for a lesser sentence. And even the ex-king of Yugoslavia was contacted, hoping he might have some influence on the British Home Secretary to intervene. The Home Secretary again wasn't having any of it. And I think he said something along the lines of, there was nothing in the case to warrant any intervention by the Home Office or by any other, obviously, official governing body. So Nenad's execution would most certainly go ahead. So again, as we make our way back to the car, the two fields, you've got the first field, as we go back, the bypass, the A56, followed by the second field, which again, many, many witnesses and people who worked at the plate lace cabin all said you had to get past to get to where we've just been. Now obviously the A56 back in 1950 wasn't here. None of this was here then, so where this road is meandering round to the bridge, I personally think that where the SOS sign is and the trees on the left, I think that path that we're going to go to continues straight across and straight down here. Um, I don't like to say this. This is obviously quite a modern, a modern pathway over the flyover. But yeah, the three houses at the top, in between them trees is where the horse and jockey pub was and I, I just think that pathway would have gone straight down and then obviously merged onto where we've just been and they probably could have quite clearly seen the railway line from the main road because a lot of these trees wouldn't have been this high back 70 years ago now in January 1951 the execution of Nened would take place at Strangeways prison 
the hangman that morning was none other than Albert Pierre Point, the infamous uh, executioner back at the time. And the story was, Nenad, even though his a reprieve was ignored, the appeal was quashed, um, he wrote to Will the night before, leaving everything to Lisa or Liza. Um, whilst he might have seemed to have acknowledged his fate at that point, the following morning when Albert Pierre Point came into his cell, into a condemned man's cell, Nenad wouldn't go to the gallows on his own accord, which uh, it's quite understandable. Um, he literally had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the point where his legs were pinioned, the white cloth was put over his head, and then obviously Pierre Point pulled the lever and then Ed dropped to his death. Really is a sad, uh, a sad ending to such a horrific story. Now there's a twist, a sad twist to these, this story. Um, and it involves Nenad's mother and his wife. He had a wife called Anita, or Anita. Now, first off, his mother, Maria. Now, Maria had sent some form of telegram or some, some request to come to the UK the week before her son's execution. But for whatever reason, she never arrived. Um, some think it was due to ill health, perhaps, uh, because it, Anita, Nenad's wife, also contacted um, Nenad's solicitor or barrister shortly after his death, wanted to come and speak to her husband before he died. She was completely unaware that Nenad had been executed around six days, I think it was, prior. Now, in the letter she wrote to Nenad's solicitor, she actually said something on the lines of Maria Kovacevic couldn't come to the UK, again, like I said, because of her health. But we're not too sure if that was the reason why his mother Maria didn't come over. But she was supposed to stay, I think it was called St. Peter's Place, or a hostel at St. Peter's Place in Manchester. I'll put the, the name down below. She never arrived. So she never got to saw her son in the last few days of his life. And neither did his wife Anita. Now, the sad thing about the Anita one is she actually never knew her husband had been executed. And yet she still tried to come over to the UK to speak to him one last time. That I find, it's sad, that is really sad. Um, the whole story's sad. Everything about this tale is sad. Two young men who, whilst they were refugees here in the UK, working over in Blackburn, because both of them worked together at the same paper mill, they both knew each other. Like I said, I'm not saying they were good friends on you know, extremely good terms, but they obviously worked together, they obviously knew each other, to a point trusted each other. But for some reason, on Sunday the 8th, something happened whilst they were making their way down this lane from where the bus dropped them off just at the top here. Something happened on this trip down to where they ultimately finished at the plate lays cabin. And both men's lives and the lives of their families, or Nenad's family especially, it would change forever. Really is such a sad tale. Now if you like this story and you want more please comment down below. Tell me your thoughts on on Nenad especially. Do you think he was premeditating this murder all along or was it just one of these moments, a crazed moment where things escalated and obviously he snapped, he's picked the axe up and he's took the life of another man. And like I said, I personally don't believe he did it intentionally, I just think he snapped obviously panicked, tried to cover his tracks, tried to leave, you know, because um, like I said, he admitted to it as soon as he was arrested, but I'd like to know your comments down below. And like I said, don't forget to give us a, a like and subscribe, because obviously we try to come out as much as we can to, to record videos. Uh, but in the meantime, as I always say, at the end of all these videos, don't forget to take care, look after yourselves more importantly, and I'll be back soon with another tale from our past.
as you can see, a lot of this is uh, new developments. But just where these houses are here, that is where the old horse and jockey pub used to be. And there was a bus stop directly outside one of the entrances, if you will, to the pub. That has been moved just to the left of this wall. You can just about see the new bus stop, the bus shelter. But we believe this was the lane that both Radomir and Nenad would walk down on October the 8th, 1950. And as you can see, there's a public footpath side. But yeah, the bus stops there and the old horse and jockey pub would have been just here. 